Reading from the book of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. There was a certain rich man who clothed himself in purple and fine linen, and who feasted luxuriously every day. At his gate lay a certain poor man named Lazarus, who was covered with sores. Lazarus longed to eat the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Instead, dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried by angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. While being tormented in the place of the dead, he looked up and saw Abraham at a distance with Lazarus at his side. He shouted, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I'm suffering in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received good things, whereas Lazarus received terrible things. Now Lazarus is being comforted, and you are in great pain. Moreover, a great crevasse has been fixed between us and you. Those who wish to cross over from here to you cannot. Neither can anyone cross from there to us. The rich man said, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house. I have five brothers. He needs to warn them so they don't come to this place of agony. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They must listen to them. The rich man said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will change their hearts and lives. Abraham said, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, then neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. The word of the Lord. Mirror, mirror on the wall, which is the fairest vision of God's kingdom of all? I feel like our story is inviting that kind of a question today because we have a vision of the kingdom on earth and a vision of the kingdom in the afterlife yet to come. And which one appears to be the most fair, the most just, the most faithful? I think they both raise some serious questions. We have the story of Lazarus, Eleazar, he whom God helps. Have him with sores and sickness and hunger who starves and waits outside the rich man's gate in the present life, begging for scraps, looking for food, praying for relief, while just beyond the gate, the rich man clothed in purple has all he could ever need and plenty more where that came from. Why is it, as the story says, that some receive much in this life and others receive so little? Perhaps that image of the kingdom in the present isn't an image of God's kingdom at all. But then we get to the afterlife and where we come to the place where the first shall be last and the last shall become first, as it would seem, where the tables have turned and where we find Eleazar, upon his death, welcomed into the arms of Abraham, the great patriarch of the Abrahamic faith and of the Jewish people. But when the rich man clothed in purple dies, we find him in a place of eternal torment, where he is tormented by the flames, he is bothered and is desperate for even just a small drop of water. And he cries out, Who will help me? And casting his eyes across the chasm, he sees Eleazar and Abraham. And 
he says, come, let me receive even just a moment's reprieve. Send me but just a drop of water that I might feel the coolness on my tongue and have even the moment, most momentary of reprieves from this suffering and this torment now. And the answer then is that in life you had much given to you while Lazarus had little. Now in the afterlife, much is being given to Lazarus and little is being given to you. And besides, even if I or Lazarus or Abraham wanted to reach you, a great divide has been set between us now that we cannot cross. The terms have been set and you must now spend your eternity in this place of torment while Lazarus spends his in the arms and the welcome of Abraham. Now I'm not sure if that one's exactly a fair vision of the kingdom or not either. I want to know what great sins has this rich man committed that he is being cast into the flames. For if we look at the story, perhaps the only sin that he is guilty of is that of neglect of his neighbor at the gate. Could he have done something more for Lazarus during his life? Well, yes, undoubtedly he probably could. Could he have done something more for any number of other Lazaruses who might have lived outside of his walls and beyond his gates? Any one of the means that this man must have had surely could have done more. But does that mean that he is to be damned to an eternity of torment and flame? It's not his wealth that is necessarily a sin because we see Abraham on the good side of the divide. And we knew Abraham was a man of great means and great wealth as his journey came to a close. He managed to collect and accumulate a large family with many, many herds and was able to accumulate the wealth that made him a great patriarch. And he was generous and able to be a benefactor to not just his family and his household, but to others as well. So what sin did this rich man commit that on the far side of death, he should be condemned to the flames for the rest of time with a crevice set between him, between Lazarus and Abraham and the place of rest that he could never cross and by which he could never be reached. Is this a just ordering of the kingdom as well? We have these mirror images playing back and forth. On the one side of the mirror we have Lazarus in life suffering just outside the gate of one who could have helped him. And then in death we now have the rich man suffering beyond an immovable gate beyond a great chasm, and Lazarus being the one who would be in a position to help him. These images flip-flop the roles of the characters and they create this mirroring back and forth that raises questions and invites our own thoughts and our own contemplations on this well. Because as I've thought through this time and again, I have wondered, where is God's justice on either side of the mirror? Bless you. How is it that God is allowing one to suffer so greatly in this life, sores, disease, and hunger? And then, on the flip side, God will allow the other to suffer in the afterlife, flames and torment, begging for even a drop of water. Where is God's love? Where is God's compassion in both sides of this mirror? It is the first becoming the last, and the last becoming the first. But what is fair about a world in which some are going to inevitably, inevitably be left last, suffering either in eternity, in eternity or in life? I have struggled with and wrestled with and argued with this story from Jesus going clear back to my seminary years. I took a parables course and I was assigned this reading as my research topic, which means I spent a lot of time trying to read the writings of people who read Greek and Hebrew, because I don't read those things, and even reading their interpretations is hard enough, but trying to determine what is going on here. Is this a condemnation of the rich man's wealth? Well, then what's Abraham doing in it? Is it a condemnation of the rich man's inaction and his failure to reach out to those in need around him. Because Abraham was known to do that. What, is it, what kind of condemnation does it raise that Lazarus is allowed to suffer 
at all? And was the rich man's inaction so great that he warranted an eternity of his punishment? Which is the fairest image and vision of the kingdom of all? And the answer is, I don't know. And I'm not sure either of them are. And I think that's the power of stories like this. My professor and I, he had a criterion by which he determined whether a parable was really parabolic. And he said, if it wasn't parabolic, it was more of a metaphor or a story. And so he and I debated for a long time about whether this was really parabolic or not. He ultimately came down the idea that maybe it's more of a metaphor because there is a more explicit meaning to be found in this text. It's not as easily open to interpretation the way that a parable invites us to explore any number of possible answers and any number of them could be true and correct. Whereas this one, this one leaves me wondering, what is the true and correct answer? And I've only found the possibility of one. Thank God this is a story. <laughs> Thank God these are images that Jesus has crafted and made up to share with those around him to convey a point. Thank God Lazarus is not a real human being who is suffering although surely he stands in for those in this world who suffer. And thank God that the rich man is not a real human being who has now been condemned to the flames, even though it raises the question of what is happening in God's justice in the afterlife. No, the nice thing about the mirror image is once you begin to put it into that concept and into that role, it invites you to look into the mirror and see what you find reflected back to yourself. What does our kingdom look like? Does it look like the image of the afterlife? Does it look like the image of the present life? Does it look like a warning that maybe we shouldn't look like either of these images? Does it look like an opportunity that we might be able to change the world before it becomes a problem? Whenever you hear people who are prophetic telling a story about a possible future, they're always talking about the present. Because that possible future is an indictment on what is happening around us right then and there in that moment. And while Lazarus may not have been real, a fictional character for this story, he surely represented the injustice of the world in which Jesus' hearers were living. That people were starving and hungry. That people were diseased with no hope for healing. That people were begging for the scraps, not even necessarily outside the doors of the wealthiest, but outside the doors of their neighbors who could not help themselves, much less help each other. It's an invitation then, when we look in that mirror, to ask if this is the world we want to see when we look at ourselves. Do we want to see a world in which the Lazaruses are left hungry and begging and unhealed? Or can we change it into a world where the ones whom God helps are the ones whom we help? That we become the messengers of God's love. That we become the hands and feet of the body of Christ who walk forward and reach out and lift up the Lazaruses of the world so that they do not have to suffer now. Could we be the ones who invite the rich rulers clothed in purple to look beyond their walls and see a world in need and an opportunity to help in ways that you or I may not be able to do on our lonesome, in ways that our church could never raise the money to do by ourselves. But we might be able to invite others who can. The mirror image, it isn't a message of what we are locked into. It's an invitation of what we could become. Mirror, mirror on the wall. What's the most just image of God's kingdom of all? Perhaps it's the one that we continue to struggle and strive and prayerfully make with the time and the resources that we have. May God help us to look into the mirrors in our lives faithfully so that we might see the promise and the possibility of all that God can do and what we might do. Amen.